Welcome to Uncomfortable Conversations about Culture and Christianity. My name is Eric, and today I'm joined by Jess. Hello, world. And Alex. Yippee! Hi, yay! Oh, I can't finish that. Uh, all right. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm thinking I, of Die I Hard. I don't know why that just came out. <laughs> I don't know why that came out either. But uh, there it was. We did it. I thought we were all going to do a part, and then I realized I was, you guys <laughs> picked the good part, the safe for work parts, and then I'm left out here. <laughs> I don't even know what else is there. But you don't? No. Wait, I don't. Okay. seen Die Hard? I haven't. Oh. I've heard there's a debate if it's a Christmas movie or not, but I've never seen it. It's a famous Bruce Willis catchphrase. yippee ki yay Oh, okay. Yeah, it's like not a it's like yeehaw. Yes, it's the Lawrence Welks show. Uh, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> we'll tell you later. <laughs> yeah, sorry but you if can't, that triggered anyone. But you can't tell your parents if we tell you. I will not if we teach you these words later. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, speaking of words, you know, words, words matter. We we've, do. we've learned that before. Uh, and sometimes you might have to apologize if you have ever uh, eaten a coworker's food. And so, <laughs> what a transition! <laughs> I would like to know if any of you have ever done that on uh. purpose or accidentally. <clears throat> have you ever raided the work fridge? <sighs> have you ever? And maybe we could even flip it. And if that's not the case, has anyone ever ate your food? Okay. <laughs> You look guilty. I you do Alex look looks guilty. guilty. I don't think I've ever purposefully <laughs> searched for someone's food and eaten it. But I can't get over the glasses. I do. It's driving me crazy. I do. I did work in student ministry for a long time, and so there was always food in the refrigerator from some kind of event mm-hmm. that someone would have. We have a huge, like a big, you know, commercial refrigerator in the student center, and not like a walk-in, but it's larger than a home one. I don't know why I needed to no, call it. Is there. it a Maytag? A <laughs> I don't know. Frigidaire. And also, people would leave it open sometimes, so there's a lock on it now. But I digress. And so there were there would be times where I didn't necessarily ask like whose event it was from or if they're mm-hmm. going to serve it later. Um, but there was a culprit um, that worked at Christ Community Church for a long time. He has since gone on to plant a city like Kansas City. His name is Eric Carpenter. Mm. And this guy, he knew... So first when I met him, he was single. And he, like, I don't think he ever bought a meal. Like, for his first (laughs) year that he worked here, he knew where every food stash was in the entire church. Like, I'd just see him in the student center, got, like, gobs of candy (laughs) that was, like, from an event. Like, he did not ask. So I feel like he definitely ate a lot of things Mm. that were mine or purchased for ministry events. Mm. Like he just knew where food was and how to how to get it without asking. So, so this Eric, is this is an oh go ahead. I feel like he took it from me. Okay, so Eric's, the reverse. If Eric's listening to this, I would love to hear his rebuttal. Yeah, he might. He, he might be because he texted me uh, a couple weeks ago about nude ball, and so right. he obviously see uh, a lot of people wondered. Some, I'm yeah. glad somebody asked. Yeah. Mm-hmm. about that. So couple weeks ago yeah okay so you've never taken food from anyone not specifically from no, okay. a, from a person maybe a soda yeah mm, i i don't i don't i think this is probably considered taking but i will admit i've i've never ta- eaten nor taken anyone's food out of the fridge or but, in any way but <laughs> there's a big there have been coming. a couple times and i i mean this is probably also wrong but i actively have done this okay i'm just confessing is that i will bring like a diet a can of diet coke from home and it's not cold and i'll go put it in the fridge and okay, i see okay. that there's a cold one there and i'm like if there's if that person's oh, saving it i'll just sw- swap oh, it out that's that's and cold. i take the cold that one is, cold. is that i think that that's that's wrong i think if you don't but know i'm when, admitting i've done it and when I they're think, gonna drink that like what if they would walk in like five minutes later like oh i, I just and can't listen, wait for this cold diet the only coke. other person i know that drinks diet coke with me on our side of the offices is Craig Walter. So mm. Craig, I'm sorry. Wow. If it if it is you, Craig. You okay. Well, we can talk about it later. So wow. it's the so same there, same there can. So if it's like a it's specialty can, can or something like that, you wouldn't go to Oh, move. never. It's not never, like you're never, replacing never. the 12 ounce with an 8 ounce or something no, like no, that. No. Okay. okay. That's good. Still wrong. I have I have better. caught somebody drink to eating my food. <laughs> But really? I won't. I can't say who. <laughs> can't say. And I would just like, like oh, from that a was, lunch. You like, yeah. <laughs> like from like, like school like, lunch. It was theme? like it, it was a cheese stick. <laughs> 
I can't say who. Someone I won't stole say your who. cheese stick. They know, you know who you are if you're listening. <laughs> were they peeling it or yes. were they biting it? Because that's a really... Both. Oh. It was like a peel and a bite. And I was like, where'd you get that? Oh, okay. It's okay. Wow. You could have just asked me. I, so yeah. now I just, you know... So they work here at the church. <laughs> is what you're, yep, they currently that's employed. all the info I'm going to get. And, you know, it might be fun for people to imagine yeah. who it is. Go to cccomaha.org like, <laughs> slash staff and <laughs> <laughs> who looks like these peel and <laughs> bite a cheese stick. <laughs> There's already judgment for that. Yeah. And then not only did they peel and bite a cheese stick, they peeled and bit someone else's. <laughs> they stole it. I I just don't think I could take someone. It wasn't you. What was their reaction? Sorry, I need it to was know. Like, it like was like after a, you busted them. It was like a chomp bite. Like the frozen, yeah, sorry. Or are they going to offer like, it back like, to you after they had no. already? <laughs> Did they know it was yours? Yeah, it was accident. Mm. Okay. I th- I would like to think the best. I just, so we'll just do that. I guess I when I think of eating someone else's food, I think of like their leftovers or something oh. in there. And it's just like, that's weird to me. Like I a don't, reheat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tupperware. I just, I'm already kind of weird about like a stranger's food. I don't know. I, like, I don't know. I'm just like, I don't really want to eat someone else's food in generally, but. I can't imagine, I but ever try it like just on a dish, like you're at a restaurant, a friend's like, "Want to try this squash or you know whatever?" Oh, like the chicken. Uh, that's weird, especially if they've like already been eating it. If it's like my, all of our forks are clean, it's the first stab. Maybe I would do that. I but... wish we could do a poll because I'm curious who, which one of us people think would be the food stealer. Even though I admitted that I kind of swap. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't think you do it on your own personal social media. (laughs) Me? (laughs) Be Alex. He's the food thief. Um, I don't put it out there. Put it on your social media. Yeah, we'll we'll find out. We'll get the answer. Uh, Again, we're finished actually finishing up this week, our series on sexuality. Mm -hmm. So it is coming to a close with uh, another guest. Yeah. Today's guest uh, is one of my siblings. And so, um, they don't live in town, uh, so we're going to have this conversation via Zoom, so it'll look a little different, maybe even sound a little different. But again, we just want to remind you, if this is the first stop, maybe you haven't heard the first two episodes, encourage you to go back and listen to those. But our goal uh, of these conversations is just position ourselves as we are having this conversation. And those of you who are listening, just to be in proximity to people who are part of the LGBTQIA plus community. And we just want to ask them questions, uh, hear stories that are honest, that are real, that are raw, not debate theological points of their stories, but um, we just want to have this conversation in the safest place for them to be able to share their perspective. And we're willing to have theological conversations. We think they must be had inside of the church, um, but we've just found that the safest, best place to have those conversations is usually in private. Mm -hmm. Uh, not that we're afraid to have it, but we need to be on the same page of what we think about scripture, our interpretation of scripture, be in a place where we can talk about our own sin issues, whatever those might be, and our own temptations. And uh, we know that takes a tremendous amount of trust and God mm-hmm. does incredible things in those moments, mm-hmm. but we don't have a desire for people to, you know, go plug in a minute of this conversation, use it as a sound bite uh, in any kind of way. Um, to be hurtful, to be demeaning. Um, And we know maybe that'll strike some people as, you know, not their favorite way, but we just want to put people in proximity to hopefully start to erode some of the prejudice in our lives. And so excited for this conversation. That's up next. All right. I am excited actually been looking forward to this day and this podcast for quite a while uh, to have one of my siblings on and have a dialogue um, that's been a part of our our conversations lately um, about sexuality human sexuality the lgbtq plus ia community and so the third member of that community that's going to be joining us today uh yeah holds a near and dear place in my heart uh Miss Precious Brady Davis uh, is joining us today. And so we're siblings. Precious, so good to have you here. I know it's been a busy day, busy week for you. Uh, Just released a book. Uh, Why don't you tell us a little bit about that really quick? Hi, Alex. So good to see you. Yes. Thank you so much for having me on the Uncomfortable Podcast. Yes, I have just released my book. Well, 
The official release date is July 1st, but okay. folks who have pre-ordered the book uh, are starting to get it. And yes, I've been starting my media tour and that's been fantastic. But the book is called I Have Always Been Me. And it tells a story of a resilient gender non-conforming person from Omaha, Nebraska, how they found themselves and made a way for their uh, and made a, a way for themselves uh, in in this world. Yeah, and I know I've been I didn't know all the details when it came out because I've been reading copies or edits and things like that. And you sent me that little sneak peek, which I'm I'm appreciative of. Uh, and so, just to give our listeners a point of view, I'm I'm just gonna briefly go through like. Obviously, we don't look the same. So when I say we're siblings, people are like, what is, what are you talking about? And so just a, a brief, quick history, and you feel free to jump in any, anywhere. Um, and people, if they read the book, they will, they'll see some of this. And these first few chapters, even as I was rereading it, um, just reminded of a lot of trauma that you went through as a, as a child uh, in your family and just... Yeah, it was just heartbreaking to read and even things I didn't know about, you know, as a sibling. Um, and we've talked a lot about this, but just heartbreaking things uh, that you went through growing up. You and I ended up meeting uh, through a, a school experience. So we went to quite the wild, I don't even know how, a Messianic Jewish type of school where uh, there was a stop board. You, did you ever get the stop board? I never got the stop board, but I know that Luke did. Okay, yes. One of our siblings did get the stop board. I never got it either, but literally there was like a board that said the word stop on it. And if you were uh, misbehaving and went to that principal and your parents gave permission, you were going to get a swat on the Bang. behind. Yes. <laughs> so uh, we met then. Uh, we were part of the same youth group preteens growing up. My mom uh, was a, a lunch lady at the school. And then uh, for a variety of reasons, because of all the, the trauma that was happening at, at your house, you ended up getting removed uh, from the custody there. And uh, my parents uh, were fostering people, kind of grew up in that environment. You knew that about them. You had been coming over to our house, uh, building some of that relationship. And then I just remember one waking up one morning and there you were, which was not a totally uncommon uh, <laughs> appearance obviously in our house growing up and you got to experience that a little bit from people from germany and all sorts of things which you talk about some of those fun experiences uh in the book but we're not here to talk about karina um so that's how it happened you ended up moving in with our family um out of a out of a difficult situation um you had a had a mindset that we were an all star, great, perfect family, and and realized that that's not such a thing. But we're able to see obviously the the heart of our parents. My parents, our parents now took a, a guardianship over you uh, at that at that time. So so then you and I were in high school together, same grade, graduated the same class. But it's kind of always been a fun story because um, we are not people that most would would put in a pod. Uh, and so you were drama and always with your voice people. And I was, you know, the, the jock hanging out with my sports people and, and just in a school, most people would never even say we would hang out, but then we lived together and got to do life together. And so it's always been a, a crazy match. And even culturally now, um, you know, you being someone that's a part of the LGBTQIA community and me being a pastor, most people in culture would say, those two people cannot get along. And so hopefully just this dialogue provides hope for people and, and a way to, to have proximity and how relationships like this can exist and mutual love and respect, even though we don't theologically agree with everything in the world that we love each other that exists and we dialogue right. constantly about these types of things. So, um, so that's just a quick dump introduction to to all this but i want to i want to say i've been reading up on this you've helped me educate me just on this community um and I, I, psychologists would say anytime you've talked to a trans person 
you've talked to one trans person. So this is Precious's story. This is not everybody's story, uh, which I know you'll be clear about, but um, you are one person representing one story and there might be similarities to others, but differences. And so I want people to know every story is unique, uh, valuable in its own way, but you can't just overlay the narrative of Precious's life on every trans person. That just wouldn't be fair to anybody. So that is um, correct. So yeah, uh, one of the first things we want to just get into um, after the you know the relational dynamic that that we've had uh, as siblings and just growing up through this, we've had a lot of conversations. But I think uh, in a sub Christian culture. Um, there's just confusion around terms that even come up in this. And so that's a lot of what we're going to dialogue about today. Um, and so one of the terms that I think a lot of people don't understand is uh, gender dysphoria. And so could you just explain to us gender dysphoria, what that, what that means? So gender dysphoria means that someone is in conflict with their gender identity. And it includes various characteristics uh, on the, the body. Someone might be uncomfortable with uh, facial hair on their body. That causes them to have dysphoria with their gender. It doesn't match how they feel on the, the inside. Okay. And so uh, that's a a medical term, you know, for people that are essentially, you're saying, I feel different than what, like there's an internal struggle, a struggle between externally how I feel and internally what I feel. Right? Exactly. So I think it's also important to understand gender dysphoria. You have to first uh, define what transgender is. Okay. So the yeah. very definition of transgender is someone who does not identify with the sex that they were assigned at birth. Okay. And from that, there is gender dysphoria from that. The ways in which others perceive you, the ways in which, like I, I talked about the facial hair, for some it could be uh, various uh, uh, genitalia on the body, um, or it could be, uh, the, the ways in which uh, you speak, the yeah. ways in which you navigate the world. Yeah, that, that's good. That's helpful. And, you know, I, I spent uh, over a decade in youth ministry. Um, and so not just experiences, you know, from, from you being a sibling, but th this is something that um, I'm just seeing more and more of. I, I saw, and, and I don't know if it was just because I think our relationship and the proximity um, of of you being my sibling and, and what I've learned, I think there's just been a, a safety. I think I probably more people have come out to me than the average youth pastor or felt comfortable, hopefully in my office because of that. And I think because of that bridge and how people have seen us interact with one another and me not just shun you as most people would say in a religious community, um, that this is an underlying current an issue a struggle that a lot of a lot more teens are are dealing with a lot more families are dealing with inside the church outside of the church than most probably realize but it's just becoming more of a cultural normative and that space has been um created for people to have these conversations i think more and i and i think it's important because when i was growing up i didn't have a lot of examples of folks who were transgender, folks who were gender non-conforming. There was just one strict message that was being preached from the pulpit as I was struggling to deal what was on the, the inside of me. I didn't have any kind of support. And I think it's important because we see extremely high rates of suicide in the LGBT community, in particular when it comes to trans youth as well. And mm -hmm. so I think it's important to talk about like this intersection in the, the, the faith community. And I think that's uh, another thing that's so important, you know, is that trans people that we also are, are people of faith as, as well. It is, it is my hope that other young people 
see their value and that that God loves them. And you talked about, you know, the abandonment factor. So many young people have been uh, abandoned because of their gender or their sexual orientation. And I talk about that in my book. You know, my grandmother was a, a very religious woman and she had no awareness of the LGBTQ community. It was something so foreign to her. And I'll never forget, you know, going to Sword of the Spirit. And I write about this in the book and I see all of my things in trash bags and with an Avalon CD placed on, on, on top of it. That was the only way she knew to, to, to speak to me. And for many years that carried a, a deep pain in my life. And so I think it's important to talk about so that young people have some kind of resource and an outlet to discuss it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree. And just, just for people to be able to come and feel like there's a safe place to share, Hey, this is a real experience I'm going through. This doesn't make sense. And, and then for, from there we can recommend, you know, and this will get into our next question, some places for, for them to be able to wrestle with this with professionals. And one thing I've, I've learned as a, as a pastor is there's people that come in all the time to my office, to our, our church that have a lot of pain. Um, and, and I think sometimes in ministry, um, pastors and myself included, uh, we're more like if you if you think in the medical field, um, we're more like a general doctor where you you can come in, I can take your temperature, help help figure out what's going on, but then I've got to send you you know there's a lump there. Okay, let's get you to a specialist to be able to talk to somebody uh, about what this actually looks like. And sometimes I think pastors malpractice because we think we have the answers to everything, and instead of and we feel this pressure to have to deliver on the answer to everything instead of helping get people into specialist counseling, therapy, psychologists that can help, uh, that are more trained specifically for this kind of stuff. Um, I'm so glad to hear you say that because I talk about that in the book based on my own experience, you know, of just being told that, you know, that I need to rely on prayer. And mm -hmm. there were many times where I would find myself kneeling at an altar in consecration asking God to, to take this away from me. And it wasn't until I felt like I was talking to an actual counselor, an actual mental health professor to actually understand what was happening on, you know, the inside of me, you know, of talking to an actual, you know, professional, I think that you all do great work when it comes to healing and, and, and speaking to the soul. And that's ultimately what like being trans is, that is a, a, a soul journey of checking into one's authenticity of saying, this is who I am. This is what my spirit is that I believe for me, that my spirit is a, a feminine spirit. And I, and I knew that from a very early age. And so, yes, I think that's important that you rely on uh, professionals who are experienced uh, in mental health, public health, so important. Yeah, and so getting into that, um, what is just the in general process you know, if somebody's having these feelings of gender dysphoria, whatever it might be, whatever's leading to that, I think there's maybe a misconception that, you know, I want to act more feminine or I like to bake or whatever the gender stereotypes are, um, that if I just want to change my gender, if I want to be transgender, that I can just like go to a doctor one day, take a magic pill, and then all of a sudden, you know, schedule surgery or whatever it might be, and then, you know, transition genders. What, In general, what what's that process actually look like for the person that doesn't really understand, uh, you know, the, the evaluations that go into it, the time that goes into it, all that kind of stuff? Yeah, so for starters, I think it's important to say that the only thing that makes someone trans is to say that you're trans. You, I love how you started the, the top of this conversation with that 
my experience is my experience alone. The, the trans community is on a robust spectrum. There are some individuals who have surgery. There are some individuals who, who do not. And that is not the, the basis of one's gender. The basis of one's gender is a, a self-affirming journey. And for some people, that takes many years for someone to come to that full awareness of recognizing that they are trans. But yet we are seeing young people, younger and younger, saying that I'm non-binary, that they don't have a gender, that they don't identify on one side of the, the, the spectrum or not. But... Uh, there are individuals, some folks take hormones. At the beginning of my transition, I did take hormones and now I'm on and off of them because I'm extremely comfortable with within my body and within myself. And within that process at the beginning, I had to attend vigorous therapy to ensure that this was something that I really wanted to do. Um, there's a great conversation now regarding, you know, hormone blockers and, and youth playing in sports. That is not a decision that is taken lightly by, by medical professionals. Um, you are, are signed up by a doctor of saying that this person, that they, this is how they identify and this is their, their diagnosis, that this person has gender dysphoria. And so it's really about affirming one's self um, in, in, in who they are. And you'll see that no one trans person has the, the, the same journey. Uh, I'm a person who has what they call passing privilege. And so navigating society, uh, I am not often recognized as someone who is trans. I mean, obviously, like I am a vocal advocate for the trans community, and I choose to, to do that so that there is space and people can remove all sorts of other kinds of stigma regarding people who are trans, right? Like I'm a professional, I'm a, a mother, and I want people to see that, but no person's experience is the same in the, the the trans community and it's all about being who you are it's about the the authenticity that matters there are trans folks who do not pass in society but those pers those people are just as valuable as the people who do pass and so we are a robust uh, community of, of of folks who who are resilient and we have a, a great history of folks in, in history who have paved the way for people like me to be here today. Hmm. I know, obviously I had a, a front seat in a lot of ways to this transition in your life. Um, I remember one of the summers, uh, in college, we lived together. We were roommates, and I, I think at that time we were both. I always tell told tell parents um, when I was working with students that from the earliest age, there's a soundtrack that's that's played on repeat in the back of every person's yeah. mind. Yeah. Who am I? Who am I? Who am I? And it's this quest for identity. I think a God given quest for identity, and we answer that in all sorts of ways. You know, different people. Uh, find the answer to to um that in all sorts of of ways and we're not here to to talk about where everyone finds that but the reality is we all have that and, and that quest for identity who am i how did i come to be what's my purpose in life and, and i remember even you know that year you know me wrestling through going to a bible college super conservative raised in you know a bible believing place and 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 that all hasn't changed that I, I believe in, in the Bible. But like, I, I remember that year, a friend that we grew up with, one of my best friends from high school ended up in jail for murder. <laughs> uh, I've got a sibling who is a part of the LGBT uh, Q plus community and, and wrestling through that. I've got a, another sibling who got pregnant out of wedlock. And I remember just like, man, how, God, how are you going to ever use me to, reach people when these are like the worst of the worst offenders according to just how i was raised like these are these are the worst you know if you get near any of these people you're going to get diseased stay away from them and there was just that mindset of of that and so i remember just wrestling through 
God, have you called me into this? Where do I find my identity? Is and and, and you were wrestling through your own uh, you know identity you know story in that, and so um, yeah, I, I think that I, I remember you know that moment of both of us just kind of trying to trying to figure you know that out. Um, and yeah, and I think that that perfectly encapsulates that each and every one of us are on a, a journey to, to authenticity. And it's important that we affirm that in folks. And for me, as long as I can remember, I remember saying to my grandmother, like, I'm a girl. Like, I, I knew that. And then as I, I grew up, I felt it was my, my sexual orientation that I came to more and more awareness about. And there's this one moment, and I write about this in the book, I'll never forget you and I went to a, a youth retreat together. And I remember being in the back of a worship experience and the, the crowd kind of parted and a pastor came off the platform and, and said to me, you are not a woman, you are a man. And I remember the, the public humiliation of that experience. It was sort of someone reading me in front of the entire congregation of uh, something that I had not come to terms with. But through our relationship, I felt that I had always received an unconditional love. Like that summer that we had lived together, I was not the prettiest, <laughs> you know? Like I was still figuring out like my own, my own womanhood. And I felt that you were just there just to support me, just like us living together that summer. Like I'll never forget. Like I just felt like you were holding up a silent mirror to me. And I feel like even though that we are on opposite sides of the spectrum, I feel that love, I think that that's so important for you to tell that story of that even though there is one prescribed way of, of, of being, I think you show that ministry comes in, in, in multiple forms and that you've really leaned into that. And I appreciate that. Hmm. Um, I, yeah, I appreciate you, you sharing that. Um, definitely a journey. And, and there's been a lot of, you know, worries for me along, you know, along the way, knowing I'm going into ministry and, uh, you know, even my wedding, there was so much inviting you to be a part of my wedding, you know, even though you, uh, you know, there was fear of like, how are people going to respond to you? you know, you being in my wedding and how are people going to respond to me? Uh, but people just don't know that relationship. People don't know the inner dialogue that we're having. And right now we're having a public conversation that everybody can hear, but we have private conversations, yes. you know, and, and we want to model. And my hope is to model that these relationships can exist. We can ha give each other dignity, respect one another, and, and to love unconditionally despite our own thoughts and opinions and and misunderstandings and so and i remember one of those misunderstandings too was just a quick story where i didn't fully realize what you were going through until i i was going to the airport to pick you up um in the middle of when you were transitioning aaron my wife and i were married and got pulled over on the way to the airport to pick you up tags were expired uh, on the car and um so I got a fix it ticket from the Omaha police department. Thank you Omaha police department for giving me the fix it ticket and, and, and giving me grace there. So I was like, good, this is good. I, I parked at the, at the, at, not the hotel at the airport waiting for you went on and, you know, renewed my license. So I wasn't in trouble that I wouldn't have to pay a ticket or fine picked you up. And then we were driving through, um, Carter Lake and we got pulled over, you know, the officer's like, you know why I pulled you over? Yeah, I know. I just got this fix a ticket from Omaha police. And I could just tell that they were, I, I felt uncomfortable with the, the way that they were approaching us, looking at you. Um, I don't know everything that was going on in their head, so I don't want to write a false narrative, but I, I remember for the first time feeling that, that weight 
of uncomfortableness that was shared and how they were just talking to you, asking you questions when you had nothing to do with it. And, um, and then ended up giving me a ticket, <laughs> even though I had already corrected it. They said, sorry, I'm in another jurisdiction. And they kind of used their authority. I felt like to stick it to us <laughs> and that. And so it was one of those first, those first, um, moments where I could start to feel some of that empathy as a white middle-class male. Um, I don't get a lot of those experiences, but it was just like a sliver of what you've endured both as a person of color and a, a trans person who at that time maybe wasn't passing, you know, you were in the, in the middle of transitioning. And so uh, I, I, that story always just sticks with me. I, I want to get to a couple of, yeah, go ahead. I, know, I, I think, no, I think that uh, that story is important for two reasons. I, I think it shows the, the intersectionality uh, that people of marginalized identities have to deal with, you know, that, that is the aspect of general safety in the world. That's something that I have to think about every day when I, I leave my home. There are countless trans women of color who are murdered, you know, across this country for, for being themselves. And that is what it is to be a, a person of color. And I think that's what being an ally is, to know someone else's experience, to, to stand in the, the, the gap for them. Who knows what it would have happened if you would not have been there and it wouldn't have, and it would have just have been me alone. That situation could have ended up completely different as we've seen across the country with folks like Sandra Bland, right? Like we've seen like what happens in incidents like that. And to be trans in this country, it's, difficult. Imagine trying to navigate employment, housing, affirming healthcare. Those kinds of situations are commonplace and you are disrobed of your dignity at every turn. And that is not something that trans folks are asking for. Like we are asking to be seen and be treated with dignity and to be treated as a part of humanity that we are people and that our lives matter and that we don't deserve death because that that is that that is the opposite of of treating people with dignity is that our existence that we that we are that we're not here and that we be treated fairly that that's what we're asking for mm. so i think a couple of things that might be helpful for people is I know the issue of pronouns, it comes up and it's coming up more and more, um, you know, with colleges and, and workplaces, uh, asking people to identify their, their preferred pronoun, whether that's, you know, he, she, they, them. Um, so as we get into a, a term, I don't remember where I heard it, but into the term gender hospitality, why is that important to you? Um, I, I, and I know I struggled, you know, I knew you as one name for a long time and I've wrestled in my faith uh, through like, am I being honest with this? Should I call, you know, should I make names? And then it's just clunky because you're just calling someone a different name when you've called them a, one name for years. And, and so there's, and you've given grace in, in the middle of that, but why, why does gender, uh, I mean, pronoun hospitality, um, why is that important to someone to, to feel dignity, um, to feel seen and, and valued? Pronoun hospitality takes away some of that gender dysphoria. It's like calling someone by their name. Names speak to the root of our identity and, and who we are. Pronouns are how we identify and that affirms Someone That is the dignity of who we are and how we refer to people. He, she, they, even when we say it, there is, is, is meaning there. And it is just, it's just as the simple recognition of respecting someone. That is, the, that is human dignity of how someone identifies to respect them as that. And, and, and there are countless other incidents in the world where people have different names and they're asked to be called something else and we do it. When someone gets married, we, you automatically 
take on their married name. It's, it's not like, it's not that hard like to recognize someone by the gender that they identify as and the name as they go by. And I think that, I know that people are at, at different places. And one of the things like in our family, I, I would see at the beginning, like they would start calling me by my old name, but then they would call me by my new name. But for me, it was the respect, like, that showed me that at least like they were trying. Um, and that's, that's, sh- that is an act of love, like in itself of recognizing me as her. If you call me, he, you are demeaning me. You are disrespecting me because I am not a, he, I am a, she, and it's just as about affirming a person it's general respect. And it comes down to, our humanity. I feel like we as people need to look at opportunities for us to uplift each other's humanity. And that's, that is the basis of, of what it is for me because it is actually an act of violence to misgender someone. And it leads to the other things that we talked about earlier. It leads to that harassment. It leads to the violence. If someone is calling me he in a public place, that puts my safety in danger. And I want to, I simply want to navigate the world in, in, in peace in my gender of <laughs> so all i ask is that we just be affirmed and it's just it's, it's it's being respectful and 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 you and you talked about this earlier of like i love it that you and i come from opposite end of the spectrum and that we have various political beliefs and i want to see us come back to that of uh, there's so much upheaval happening like in this country And we need to show that at the heart of what it is to be American is to respect our differences, that this is the fabric of our country. Like this is what democracy is. And not only political democracy, but spiritual democracy that we grant life to each other, right? We have the power of life and death in the tongue. And it's about providing that, that life, uh, that, that spirit uh, to someone, that they know that they have value and worth. Think about the quiet moments that we all have in our lives. What are, what are people saying to themselves in the, the, the quiet moments? Do I belong? Do I have dignity? And it's just as uh, another affirmation. Yeah, thanks. And and yeah, a lot of this conversation is to, designed to be help me understand, help us understand uh, and put, you know, we all have prejudice. It's just a part of, of who we are being people that are raised in certain environments. And most of it's not even our fault. It's, it's just we're we are products of, you know, where, where and when and all that we were born. But then our job is to put ourselves in proximity to start to erode that prejudice. And that, again, that's my hope is to not interject all my opinion here, but to of let course. you speak. Yeah. And, 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 to, and, and it's also our job to uproot that prejudice. Like we have to analyze where does that come from and, and why, you know, like, why are we have to examine like why are trans folks being demonized like why are we the 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 scapegoat why are we made to by certain folks in the faith community why are we seen as evil you know why do we become the the political talking point of the day i never asked for that I just like want to exist in the world. I am a mom. I am a professional. That is what I do. And all I, at the end of the day, I want to be happy. And I think it comes back to our humanity. I want to come home at the end of the day. I want a place to call home. And I think that's another part of the conversation. It's about finding 
home. And, and that's why I wrote this book. There are so many trans people who don't know home and are simply trying to find home, finding identity, finding a, a place of someone who understands the essence, your, your worries, your concerns, and, and, and someone who will comfort you. And I think that's what trans people are looking for through our identity. We're looking for comfort, looking to be uh, affirmed, looking for a place to show who we truly are. Yeah. Yeah. I think we're pilgrims, you know, in the, in, in the Christian worldview, making progress on our way towards a promise that ultimately God has given us. And so uh, I'm not going to start preaching right now because you're here for me. <laughs> so a cu- last couple of questions. So undoubtedly, and you knew this, you know, coming on, there's going to be people that, um, disagree with everything you've said, parts of what you've said, all of that kind of stuff. Um, how, how can you be an ally for someone? Um, how can a person listening to this be an ally when maybe they're not there theologically with you or they think some of the things that you've said are just false, but how, how can, how can someone be an ally for you and continue to give you dignity even though they disagree with you, you know, for whatever reason, how, how do you dialogue with people that disagree with you? Do you just write them off or, or just, just get the person, the school teacher that's got, you know, a, a, a trans kid in their, in their classroom, the, the employee, how, how do I become an ally or, and help love somebody? Um, even if I feel for whatever reason, I can't, I can't agree with all their decisions. Yeah, well, I first want to say that being an ally is is standing in the gap for someone. And I think uh, our relationship is a good example. Uh, I love the example of being in your wedding. At that time, I was a very gender non-conforming drag performer at the time. And above all, it wasn't the fact that I was doing drag. It was the fact that you and I had a relationship that you and I shared countless memories, you know, that we were, were family and that love has always been at the center. And I think it's about centering love for one another, centering love for humanity. And for me, I think it's important that we talk about difference. Like we need to get outside of our bubbles of like what we know and what we know and what we have just been mm-hmm. taught. Like for me, like I should always be learning. You know, there is always another culture that I should be learning about that is not my own. There are lots of various other religions in the world different than my own, but I can learn something from those other cultures. I think we can learn something from the way people live in the world, how people come to find themselves, how people live in the the world with various experiences i think that is what it is to to be human to listen that that is that's the first place let's let's start listening to one another so often when we come to these conversations we come with our defenses already made up we come with our our minds already made up that, that this is the definitive and this is what it is that's not what it is to be human And that's something what we believe in the trans community, that we are always in transition, that this never stops. And I know that's a common theme in in Christianity, that you're always changing, becoming, uh, becoming anew. And so I think listen, loving folks, meet people where they are. And then uh, another point that I think is so important, important in allyship is, Folks can't give you what they don't have. Everyone does not have the emotional depth, the emotional capacity to engage in conversations like this. And if people aren't ready, they're not ready. And that is a conversation that we have to have. It's important that we create safe spaces. Like I would not have come on and had this conversation with you today if I felt that I was not, I didn't feel safe 
like with you to have this conversation, you know, that it would be in an exploitive nature or it would be in a, a nature that was condemning. Like that is not something that I would participate in. And so I think we need to expand the circumference of how and why we have these conversations. Like these conversations are about understanding difference that should make us better people. The world is a very diverse place. Trans people are your neighbors. We are your coworkers. And, and I hope that this creates like a better understanding. And that's something that I've tried to do with my life. Like there are countless coworkers across my career. When I, when I, when I leave a job and I go to something new and they say, thank you. Thank you so much for, for showing me what it is to be a trans person, to be a trans person in America. And, and that's why I wrote this book, that I want people to be giving and understanding to other young people like me, you know, who came from a broken home, who was a, a foster child, who felt displaced my entire life. And abandonment was the only thing that I ever knew. I found myself and my place in my gender. And I'm so glad I, our whole family has been so affirming of me and accepting of me. And I think it's been a journey, but for my family to be at my wedding, one of the most powerful things in the world of me loving another trans person, that is dignity to me. And I think that so often LGBTQ people have been demonized from the, the pulpit and there hasn't been an opportunity to talk about the ways in which we examine spirituality in our lives or, or have spirituality. I have a relationship with God and for many years have I feel this is my most divine self. I feel like this is this is God in 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 me of my gender. My highest self is a a feminine spirit. And it just is my hope that people will start to recognize and will think with empathy of what people are going through who are completely different from from them and and something that is so important to say of like that's a privilege like if you don't have to deal with something like that like you are privileged and you are in the majority like that is what it is to be a minority in america of like oh i don't have to think about my gender oh i don't have to think about my sexual orientation oh i don't have to think about my race that's not something I have to deal with. And it's easy for people to, to write that off because that's not their experience. But we're, we're humans. And like I said, it's about really centering our humanity, showing love. Hmm. Oh, man, we could talk forever, uh, but we don't have forever to talk. Uh, I could ask so many more questions and, and hopefully, like our hope is that you know, people will be able to read your book. Have my my goal is not to change everyone's position, but to change people's posture towards people. I, I think in this and hearing a real story for people that are uncomfortable or people that maybe would never walk outside to their neighbor and they're freaked out and and it's scary. I have people that look at my daughter with the things on her ears because she's deaf, and just because of their ignorance, they're like a there's fear. Ignorance breeds fear. And so my hope is that somebody is listening to this and there's less of a fear uh, of an unknown, of, of somebody that is totally different than them and they can have their posture towards people. I, I think the way we treat creation reflects how we feel about its creator. And I believe God created you and, and you were, you were created by God. And I need to treat you as somebody who God loves deeply that God didn't die just on the cross for Alex, but di God died on the cross for precious. And, and I have to be in position to have my posture towards people that God created. Um, and so that's, that's my hope of this again, not to, I love, I love that. And 
And I think that is the, the core of Christianity that has always stuck with me. And it's something that I always do in my work that we should be the sick, help the homeless and support those who are most marginalized. And if I'm not doing that, I feel I'm not doing God's work. Mm. Well, again, thank you for yeah sharing your perspective, sharing your story um, today. I mean, it's bold. It's bold for you to come on to a church's podcast and I'm not scared. <laughs> yeah, and and share this. Well, it, like you said, because I think there's been trust built, and you know that it's, the design of this wasn't gotcha. I'm going to invite you on and then debate how you're wrong. Yeah. That, that's not that's not the hope of this. And so so grateful for for you being a part of this. Grateful for for our relationships, the things we've been able to learn from one another, the growth that's happened. Uh, the way we've both been able to learn to love better um, love because of this. And so thank you again. And we look forward to, you know, our, our goal is for you to be here uh, when you're in Omaha for, you know, pushing your book and your book signings and all that kind of stuff in person. So for, for our listeners, I'm sure – just like me, they've got a lot of questions or confusion or whatever. So our hope is that that they're going to submit some of those to us, and we'll be able to ask you uh, those questions in a safe place where somebody who's like, can I ask this to somebody that's in that position, that we're able to ask it under an umbrella of grace in a safe place where there's some trust that's built up. And so, Please. Yep. Thank you so much for this conversation, and I'm hoping one day I'll get to come in town and see that magnificent uh, Christmas program you all put on. All right. All right. That's the other church. That's West side. Don't you guys do like a huge Christmas production? <laughs> we do not. Like that concert and stuff? No, we used to, but. Oh, you don't do it anymore. We don't, we don't do it anymore. Okay. So, but that is my birthday. So I'd love for you to come and celebrate my birthday with me. Okay, well, uh, thank you for this conversation. Love yeah. you. All right, love you. We'll talk to you later. Hey, thanks again, everybody, for listening. Uh, like every episode, if you've got questions, we'd love to have you send those to us at podcast at cccomaha.org. You can find us on social media at cccomaha. Ask some questions there. Like I said, we hope to have Precious in the studio and ask a lot of questions. Maybe you're like me and you've got so many questions to ask right there, and we'd love to have you do that, submit those questions through through that email also want to let you know that we're going to take a four-week break uh we're getting kicked out of our podcast studio we're building more counseling offices here in this building and so we'll take a four-week break and we will see you again in the middle of july